Hi there, welcome back to our online service and today in our praying together, we'll be looking at one verse in Joshua chapter 3. This is the time whereby God was preparing the nation of Israel to cross the river Jordan into the promised land. And over here it says here in verse 5, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua, the new leader, was preparing the entire nation to go into and receive the promises that God has placed over their lives. Well, contextually, this is a group of people for the last 40 years, they've yet to see God's promise come to pass. And this is the moment after 40 years of waiting, this was the leader, Joshua's instruction to the people. A couple of things here to note. Number one is this, consecrate yourselves, which simply means this, to go and cleanse yourself, to sanctify, to purify yourself. Purify yourself. Why? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You can find that verse in Hebrews chapter 12. So consecrate yourselves. If you are waiting to believe, to receive God's promises over you and you've been waiting for a long time, well, maybe let's respond as how Joshua instructed the nation of Israel at that time to consecrate ourselves. Anything that is not of faith is sin. Anything that does not proceed from faith, our decision making, if there's fear, stress, anxiety, that is considered sin. We need a consecration, a cleansing, a purification. Maybe there have been things that cause us to be wounded, hurt, disappointed, discouraged. We've not seen God move. We've not seen God work in our lives for a long time. And that is now a hold back for us even to believe in that. God will work a promise of a breakthrough in our lives. Well, maybe it's take, taking time to consecrate, to cleanse, to purify ourselves. How? Look to God and ask for the Holy Spirit to come and renew and regenerate our hearts, our minds, that there will be a cleansing, a consecration. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. When you think about tomorrow, does it bring you worry? Does it bring you anxiety? Or there is an excitement about tomorrow? Do not worry about tomorrow. That's the encouragement that's given to us. Not to worry about tomorrow, which means as a believer, when we think about tomorrow, that is always ought to be a, a posture of faith and expectation for tomorrow. The next day, are you having that? An expectancy that God is going to do something. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Is there the faith to believe? The Lord, is Jesus still Lord over your life? Is he the one whereby the one reference in terms of every decision you're making is Jesus, Lord. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, a faith expectancy, and is Jesus number one. The Lord will do. God is the one that's doing the work. Maybe we are so stressed up because we are trying to make things work. We are trying to make things work with our own strength, our own ability, our own know-how, and it's so stressful. Well, Come back to the place of trusting that it is the Lord God Almighty who will do the work. For the nation of Israel, for those of you who are familiar with this account, all they did was to consecrate themselves, have that faith expectancy, and then they waited while the presence of God went ahead before them. That's the Ark of the Covenant in those days. The priests carried out the covenant into the river Jordan and as the people, they just waited for God to do the work, for God to stop the river flowing until it was dry and then they crossed over, which means God did all the work. Is that you today? Are you stressed up because you're trying to make things happen? You're trying to even move God, but have that faith and patience, expectancy, consecrate yourselves and know that the Lord will do the work. The Lord will do wonders, which means miracles, signs and wonders, extraordinary things. And that is my prayer for all of us today. Let's believe for wonders to take place in our lives. Wonders among us, among the people of God, among the people of faith. When we see other people having their breakthroughs in their lives, let's celebrate as if we have got our breakthrough because we are one, one body in Christ. As we are able to celebrate other people's wins and victories and breakthroughs, likewise, we will receive the miracles, the wonders taking place in our own lives. So consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Let's have faith. 
the Lord, is He still the Lord over your lives? Will do the work, will do miracles, signs and wonders among us. So Father, I pray, even as we begin our service today, Holy Spirit, wash over us, renew us, regenerate us. Wash over everything that is not of you. Sanctify us, purify us. We want to be consecrated before you and we want to have the faith expectancy that tomorrow, God, you are going to do a work. The Lord God Almighty is going to move and we are going to see miracles, signs and wonders and breakthroughs in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you have been encouraged by the time of praying together and now we're going to go on to the meditation upon the Word of God. Hey everyone, and once again, welcome to the Meditate part of our service. Thank you, Pastor Mark. And today we'd like to dive in to what we have been going through the book of Matthew, this whole series about the gospel. And Pastor Josh covered forgiveness last week while covering Matthew 18. And we are on Matthew chapter 19 today. And we're going to do something different. We're going to skip the first half of Matthew 19 and come back to it when we do a series on relationships soon. But today we're going to start off with the second half of Matthew 19 from verse 13 onwards. And I want to talk to you today about entry requirements. Uh, something that sounds a bit strict. I remember when we, I was in the army, all of us have to go through the army if you are a resident, a citizen of Singapore. And we all had to do guard duty at some point of our army lives to protect the premises of the camp that we were a part of. And there were strict entry requirements. You can't just uh, go into any camp or army premises. We couldn't just let anyone in either. And how many of y'all remember just a few years ago, this is not very long ago, we had this requirement, especially in Singapore, if you wanted to enter a shopping mall and you were not vaccinated, you couldn't enter the mall. You couldn't enter the premises. Uh, those were strange times we lived in just a few years ago. And some of you, maybe you're praying for this, entry requirements into a school. Maybe you're trying to apply for a course and you're trying to figure out what are the exact requirements academically or even how do I enter the school that I'm interested in, uh, especially as a student. And I want to talk to you today specifically about entry requirements of the kingdom. Who gets to be a part of God's kingdom? Who inherits the kingdom of God? What can we do as believers to be a part of this supernatural kingdom of God? And Matthew 9 verse 13 onwards, the Bible says this, Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Friends, we must understand the context of the text. The cultural norm in those days was when there's a holy man nearby or a rabbi nearby, parents would bring their children to get blessings. That was the norm in those days. But the other norm, the flip side of it is, in those days as well, children were usually not as valued as adults in public spaces, in religious settings. And there is an important principle here that Jesus was teaching his disciples that, quote unquote, all are welcome. It's not just those who are adults. It's not just those who are senior. But God flips the requirements that the disciples had in their minds when it comes to God's kingdom. That it is not just for the adults. It's not just for those who are senior but it is for everyone, including the children. This is a powerful teaching moment about what it is not about. It's not about age or experience, friends. And sometimes, even as older ones, we want it to be about age and experience. But this text, this part of the text where Jesus says, let the little children come to me, is where the disciples learned that how many times have we discounted someone who is younger? Friends, maybe this is a good reflection for us as well. How many times have we discounted someone who may be a bit more inexperienced? In Jesus' eyes, the kingdom of God belongs to such. In fact, he flipped it 
And he goes on to say, the least is the greatest, the greatest is the least. Friends, are we able to respect and lift up the next generation and truly believe in them, especially here in every nation? Or do we feel that we are better than others because of our experience and our age? Are there certain entry requirements we have set that may not be biblical when it comes to ministry? And the text goes on to say, Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Friends, the other thing, it's not about, it's not about doing good deeds alone. As much as I believe in doing good, as much as I do good as well, but I truly believe it's not about doing good deeds alone to inherit the kingdom. In fact, we can never do enough good deeds. We can never do enough good to earn eternal life. The premise of that question was simple. As long as I'm good, as long as I do good, I can get eternal life. That is not true. Which deed shall I do? The man asked Jesus. But Jesus was trying to shift his mind, shift the premise to actually think it's not possible because by nature we are just not good. In fact, there is only one who is good. So doing good alone will not qualify us, will not save us for eternal life. The entry requirement is not simply to do a good deed. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, um, the young man tells us, Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is in fact stating the commandments of God. And the young man said to him, all this I've kept. What do I still lack? Friends, it's not just good deeds. Our efforts and achievements alone is not going to qualify us. It's not even our overall efforts and human achievement. In fact, the spirit of this is the man was saying, I've kept all these commands. I've not broken any of it, but no... Note the spirit behind which he was saying, I've done all this by my strength. I've kept it. I've done all this and it's still not enough. Because there is something Jesus was getting at. At the core of his heart, it's not just external compliance, but there was something Jesus was getting at. And verse 23 onwards, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Even our riches cannot help us to meet the entry requirements, friends. It's not by our efforts. It's not even by our achievements or possessions. The very thing God compares Himself to in the Bible, you cannot love both God and money, friends. Even our riches cannot bring us into the kingdom. Even the very thing we hold dear to, our possessions. Why? Because God is more interested in our internal heart condition than our external compliance to His commands alone. You can keep all the commands and yet walk away from Jesus because we are not willing to give up the very thing which defines us, the very treasure of our hearts. And for this man, it was his riches. And verse 25, finally the disciples realized when they heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In other words, Jesus, if this is the standard, who can be saved? It is such a high standard. But this is the reason why Jesus came down to earth in the first place. This is the reason we have the gospel today because friends, none of us can meet the entry requirements by our own strength, by our own effort. It is just not possible with men. But with God, all things are possible and thank God it is possible that we can enter His kingdom. So now that we have talked about what it is not, what then are the requirements to enter God's kingdom? Again, I just repeat a few verses that I've brought up, but this time highlighting different points. It says here, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And in fact, if you do 
a parallel to look at Mark at the same story, but just a different account. Jesus continues on to say in Mark 10, 14 to 15, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The first requirement is this, a childlike faith. And if you have been around children long enough, the qualities that are found in children sometimes can differ from us adults who have adulted through the journey. And sometimes we have lost certain of these qualities. Innocence, humility, dependence, and complete trust in the people that have raised us. These are essential to enter the kingdom. Recently, I was just having a conversation with a successful life coach. And one of the things he said that really got my attention was he said this, being a pastor and now a successful life coach, he said this, my identity is not even in being a coach or even being a pastor before. My identity is first being a child of God. That's how I define my world. That's how I see my own world. And he says so many times we attach our identity to what we do rather than who we already are. We are already children of God, friends. I want to encourage you with that. Regardless even of what Jesus had done or not done yet, God himself said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Friends, I want to encourage you today. A childlike faith is all that is needed. The second thing is this in verse 16 and 17 again. He said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? This is Jesus telling the man There is only one who is good. We read this text earlier, but now we're talking about the entry requirements is to reframe what we are depending on. Is it our own efforts? Is it our own goodness of our hearts? Or is it the utter dependence on God's grace? That is the requirement. The reason the man asked this question was because his framing, his entire framing of receiving eternal life was based on what he had to do, the works of his hands versus completely relying on the grace of God. And his framing of good was not on the only one who is good, but on himself, his deeds. But that is why Jesus shifted his framing. There is only one who is good. And Paul says this as well. He reinforces this in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not your own doing friends it is not by our own doing it is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast friends we need to realize this once and for all we do not earn our salvation we do not earn eternal life by our own holiness by our own doing by our own merit that is why There is no more holy and less holy Christian. We're all simply sinners saved by grace. We don't have senior Christians. We don't have junior Christians. We all need grace, including those of us in full-time ministry. We need grace and sometimes even more grace. So that, why, why? So that we do not boast. Friends, please do not use our religion to beat people down. Some people go through different processes from us. Some people have different journeys so that we do not boast when we talk to people that this is my doing. This is not our doing. Friends, the reason I'm even in full-time ministry is not because of my own doing. It's not my own merit. It's not even my own doing. It's merely by the grace of God. And Jesus goes on to say this. Again, in verse 21 and 22, I skipped this earlier on for a good reason to double down on it right now, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. The very thing Jesus was after. And you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now Jesus is shifting him, not just childlike faith, not just a dependence on God's grace, but absolute surrender. Jesus was calling him to a higher standard. If you want to be perfect, if you will be perfect, it's not just external compliance to rules and regulations and commands, but to actually 
The word perfect here actually means in the Greek word to be full grown or full age, completeness of Christian character. It's not just external adherence to the commands, but internal transformation. We are complete in Christian character. The only way to do this is to go after that thing which we hold so dearly. For this man specifically, it was the riches he had. Friends, this is a specific command to a specific person. It's not a call to all of us to now go and give all that we possess and give it to the poor and come to the kingdom of God. Context is important. Jesus knew that to get to the root of the matter, the root of the heart for this man, he had to give up his riches. He had to be fully surrendered to Jesus and be willing to follow through with absolute surrender. And for us, the challenge may, di- may be different. All of us have our journeys. All of us have our Isaacs. All of us have that very one thing that we need to absolutely surrender in order to follow Jesus. It's not enough simply to come to church. It's not enough simply to read our Bibles, to go through the to-do list of what a Christian should do. But God is more interested in the internal transformation of our hearts rather than just the external behaviors and compliance to His commands. Friends, it's way harder than just following a set of commands. And that's why Jesus also, at the end of the day, is more interested in our hearts, the condition of our hearts, rather than just us blindly following what is supposed to be good. Friends, there's a higher standard, but remember what we read earlier, with men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And last but not least, there is a reward. There is a reward. Whatever God calls us to do, He is faithful to reward us. And in verse 13, He says, To such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Friends, don't miss the reward in the midst of the command. The first reward is this, we inherit the kingdom of God. We are now children of God inheriting the kingdom. That is the benefit of being a child. You inherit the kingdom. And Romans 8 says this, If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And in those days, in ancient Roman culture, an heir had legal rights to the father's estate. And Paul uses this analogy to convey that, hey, we as believers, we can inherit the fullness of God's promises as children, as heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. But of course, it comes with suffering as well. Don't miss that. But then Matthew Matthew 19 goes on to say, when Jesus was replying to men, He said, you will have treasure in heaven. Go sell all of that. You will have treasure in heaven. Friends, the second reward is treasures in heaven for us. Whatever challenge God is asking us to do, to absolutely surrender to Him, He has given us treasures in heaven. And Matthew 6 talks about that roughly and it says, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. In fact, this text calls us to not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. Because guess what? It will be destroyed. It will get stolen from us. But treasures in heaven are impossible perishable. Treasures in heaven are secure. It's deep and lasting. It is not like treasures on earth where it decays, where it rusts. What are some treasures in heaven? Eternal life. Being with Jesus forever. The greatest joy we can ever have. A life filled with peace and joy. The things money can never buy. Reigning with Christ. Being heirs with Him being seated with Christ in heavenly places and being with Him forever. Those are treasures in heaven. And last but not least, in fact, in verse 29 to 30, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father, mother, children or land for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Many who are first will be last and the last first. Last but not least, our reward is eternal life. Friends, this is what we're living for. It's not simply to gain the treasures of this world. 
It's not simply to climb the corporate ladder. It's not simply even to climb the ministry ladder. It's more than that. Our greatest goal in this life is simply Jesus. To be with Jesus. That is the greatest reward. That we can be with Jesus forever and ever. Amen. So let's not miss this, that it's not about age or experience. It's not about our good deeds alone. And it's not about our efforts or achievements. In fact, the requirements of the kingdom is this, to have childlike faith. Friends, don't miss this. As we age, as we adult even more, don't miss this, that we're called to be children of God, dependent on His grace alone. Not trying to earn the positions and our possessions by our own merit or achievements, but absolute surrender to Him. What are we called to surrender today? Even as you're hearing this message, what are you called to surrender? What is that Isaac that God is asking you to sacrifice? For all of us is different. Amen. And last but not least, the reward is great. The reward is great. We inherit the kingdom of God, not just as children, but co-heirs. We have an inheritance in Him. And of course, there's treasures in heaven, friends. And last but not least, eternal life with Jesus. A place in heaven is not simply what I'm after. It's a life with Jesus forever and ever because I love Him so much. I enjoy His presence. I want to be with Him the rest of eternity. And so friends, I want to invite you even as we pray right now and you will take up the cup and the bread and let's remember the finished work of Jesus that because He came down, because He came to earth, you and I can now be children and co-heirs with Christ. So even as we pray and worship, I invite you to partake of the cup and the bread and let's focus on Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this word. And we pray right now, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you remind us that, Lord, it is not by our own merit, it's not by our own efforts, but it's purely by the grace of God that we are here today. So that no man may boast. The Lord, we will not boast in our own achievements. We will not boast in our own riches. We purely boast in the grace of God. I am who I am by the grace of God as mentioned by the Apostle Paul. So Lord, we just pray that right now you would do a deep work in us even as we receive this message. We ask and pray all this in your name. Amen and amen and God bless you. Thank you, Vicky, for that message just to encourage and to exalt us and just want to encourage all of us as we come to the end of our service to continue to worship God and worship God through your giving, through your tithe and, our, and your offering. Uh, the details is found on the screen right there. If you would like to give, just scan the QR code or get on to our website. Uh, just two other opportunities for us to want to get involved and the other one to also get equipped. One is this, it's an arts and crafts session that we will do with seniors uh, in our land uh, in conjunction with Lions Befrienders. This is on 22nd June on a Saturday in the morning. Scan the QR code, sign up, come and join us for a time just to be among the seniors in our land, just to encourage them and speak life into them and just do some arts and crafts with them. Well, there's going to be a little bit of attention because on that same day, there is a time of teaching and equipping. Right? It's Story of God on the 22nd June in the morning, Saturday, uh, 9 to 1, and then 23rd June, Sunday, 1.30 to 5. All right? uh, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Seth Trimmer. He's coming to talk about the story of God mapping for us throughout the whole entire Bible from Genesis right up to Revelation, how we see Jesus in every page right from the beginning. It's going to be an empowering time. It's going to be a revelational time. So if you're available, do register and come and join us for this teaching as well. Well, God bless you. Have a great week ahead.
nation shouts your name you are king over all jesus all the nations lift you high you are author of life jesus 